Welcome to Chapter 15, Physical and Cognitive Development in Middle Adulthood. So what constitutes the age range of middle adulthood? Well, if you ask Eric Erickson, he would say it's from the ages of 25 to 65. But newer theories say that young adulthood is from 19 to 34. Middle adulthood, which is what this chapter is on, is 35 to 64. And then there's young elderly, which is 65 to 79. And old elderly, which is 80 and up. So for our purposes, we're going to go with the newer theories and say that middle adulthood is between the ages of 35 and 64. So in terms of health and middle adulthood, this is the age when most people start to be concerned with their health more seriously. And that's because we experience a greater number of serious illnesses during middle adulthood. We experience more deaths of loved ones that remind us of our own impending mortality. Um, changes in our bodies are more abrupt than they are when we were younger adults. We also see a weight gain increase because our metabolism has lowered and uh, generally middle adults don't compensate with more exercise. They just keep doing what they've been doing even though their metabolism is slower. So a term you need to know for the exam is the uh, basal metabolism rate, and this is the minimum amount of energy an individual tends to use when in a resting state. And so this is um, kind of what lowers as we get older, where you're burning less energy when we're not moving. So we cannot eat the same way we did when we were younger. Uh, we also know that stress increases cardiovascular reactions, heart disease, heart attacks, um, stroke. Smoking and stress increase the risk of heart disease. And for people over 50, one or two drinks a day of alcohol can be dangerous because it can enlarge the heart and cause irregular heartbeats. We do know that muscular ability also decreases as we get into middle adulthood. But aerobic activities are really great at stopping this decline. Um, and so bottom line is um, we have to pay more attention to our health. We have to eat better and exercise more if we want to stay physically fit. As we head into middle adulthood, we also see a change in our sensory abilities. In terms of vision, at the age of 40, the lens of the eye becomes more elastic and yellow. By the age of 50, the cornea gets rounder and thicker, and the iris responds less well to light. Um, the eye actually lets in about one third of the light it let in when we were younger. And so this causes our eyes to not adapt to sudden, intense light or dark like they used to, which makes it hard to drive at night. Um, generally, older people will ask for more light if they're trying to read and it's kind of a dim area. Um, this also affects the ability to see objects up close and detect certain colors. In terms of our hearing, at age 40, hearing often declines, making it harder to detect high frequencies and human speech. And this is because in our inner ear, we have these tiny little hairs called cilia, which pick up the vibration of sound waves. But over time, those cilia can actually shatter like glass if they're rocked too much throughout the lifespan. One of the ways they can rock too much or move too much is if um, you listen to very loud music, like through headphones or at concerts. And once those cilia go away, once they shatter like glass and they're gone, they do not come back. So studies show that our culture is actually very loud, which... Um, is one of the reasons that we see more hearing loss in our culture in middle adulthood than in others. We also have those cilia inside of our nose, which allow us to um, sense odor molecules, and they, over time, through blowing our nose um, and picking our nose, they also um, fade away, and once they're gone, they don't replenish themselves. And so our sense of smell decreases as we get older, as well as our sense of taste, so let's go ahead and watch a video now on um, our sense of smell and taste decline in middle adulthood.
Uh, if your 4th of July meal didn't taste as good as you hoped, it may not be the flavor of the food that was to blame. It could have more to do with your age. Seth Doan looks at what's really behind the bland taste in our mouths as we get older. Arthur Rosenthal always loved the flavors he could create in the kitchen. I can't taste as well as I used to. You want to taste it? But these sure days when he good. cooks for his family, no. it's more a test it's of his no. memory than his taste. When I first put a forkful in my mouth, I probably will be able to taste it. After a while, it just, it kind of, the taste dissipates. Hi, Mr. Rosenthal. Hi, how are, how are you? you today? Okay. After a nasty cold last year when he couldn't taste at all, this 62-year-old decided to see ear, nose, and throat specialist Dr. Edmund Perbitkin at Thomas Jefferson Hospital in Philadelphia. Arthur came in because he perceived a loss of taste. And actually, our sense of taste, our sense of flavor, is really more complex. It's really mediated a lot by our sense of smell. Smell receptors are just hanging out there. Sensory scientist Marsha Pelshaw and, uh, researches taste and smell at Philadelphia's Monell Chemical Senses Center. When you're eating, movements of your tongue and palate push little puffs of air up to the receptors by the back way. The human mouth has 10,000 taste buds clustered on the tongue, roof, and in the throat. But all of those tiny receptor cells are responsible for sensing just five basic tastes, sweet, sour, bitter, salty, and umami, or savory. Taste is our taste buds. Right. Smell, obviously, our nose, and you say flavor is the combination of the two. Exactly. So there are three flavors. Uh, Pelshaw demonstrated coffee, how important smell is when it comes to recognizing flavor by using three different jelly beans, coffee, banana, and licorice. Without looking, take one uh, in your it head, pin pinch your nostrils, okay. don't look. Okay. Put one in your mouth and begin chewing with your nostril pinch and try to guess which one it is. Then before, I have no idea. What are you tasting? It just tastes sweet. Right. It okay, tastes now, sugary. Before you swallow, let go and see if it's any easier. Oh my gosh, banana. Yeah. Really strong. When you pinch your nostrils, you prevent air from moving between your nose and mouth, mm -hmm. and you're just getting the taste component of the, flavor. The sweetness. The sweetness. While taste buds are quite resilient, our ability to smell suffers when we age, as receptors in the nose are damaged through illness and everyday use. One study suggests a quarter of people over the age of 50 and nearly two-thirds of those over 80 have difficulty identifying common household odors. There's something called olfactory fatigue. Dr. Probitkin diagnoses his patient's smelling deficiencies with a simple scratch and sniff test. All done? Very, okay. Very tough. He's trying to help Rosenthal regain his sense of smell Actually, we don't need it. by having him take time each day to focus on specific scents, his cologne, coffee, and the garlic he cooks with. By interacting with these odors in a very specific way, you're actually probably regenerating some of those neurons selectively. And it's fancy language, but it means basically that you're teaching your brain how to smell again. No. <laughs> the ability to smell and taste can work as a warning to recognize spoiled food or even a gas leak. Did I get everybody? Did the Rosenthal, everybody? it's about enjoying okay. that shrimp scampi again. I'm not expecting miracles. Let's hope it tastes good. But a little improvement would be great, and I'm looking forward to that. Right? <laughs> For CBS This Morning, Seth Doan, Philadelphia. In middle adulthood, something called the climacteric occurs, and this is relatively abrupt changes in the body, which are brought about by um, the hormonal challenge, um, changes that are occurring and causing hormonal imbalances. In women, we call this uh, menopause. It generally occurs over a four-year period during a woman's 40s and 50s. And it is the cessation of menstruation when a woman um, is no longer fertile. In menopause, there is a decrease in estrogen and progesterone, the female sex hormones. And because of this decrease, um, women experience hot flashes, 
There can also be some behavioral consequences to menopause that include change in sexual appetite, maybe wanting more sex, maybe wanting less sex, and a change in mood. Um, some women increase sexual expressions like kissing and cuddling during menopause, and some women become more angry and depressed. Uh, we do find a correlation between menopause and unhappy marriages, unfortunately. However, there are treatments that can help with severe negative symptoms, like hormone replacement therapy, which is a hormone therapy that's prescribed to treat the symptoms associated with menopause, and it usually involves low doses of estrogen. However, there's negative side effects um, that may include the increase of the likelihood of heart attack, cancer, stroke, breast cancer, and blood clots. So many women opt out of hormone replacement therapy, and when they do, they also have the alternative of homeopathic treatments, which are natural alternative options for healthcare. Um, and so usually remedies for menopause include some herbal supplements. Okay, let's watch a short clip on menopause that goes into more depth on the symptoms of it. The list of symptoms that occur during menopause can be exhaustive, if you know what I mean. Here are a few. Hot flashes, night sweats, fatigue, insomnia, vaginal dryness, pain during sex, and reduced sexual desire. You can also suffer from frequent bladder infections, weight gain, dry skin, hair loss, and hair growth in all the wrong places. And if that's not enough, you may experience tender breasts, migraine headaches, memory issues, brain fog, generalized aches and pains, anxiety, and depression. Heck, I'm depressed just thinking about it. Seriously though, if you're dealing with any of these symptoms, it's no joke. Now some of these symptoms are caused by the hormonal changes of menopause, and others are the result of normal aging. For example, hot flashes, night sweats, and vaginal dryness are definitely associated with hormonal changes. But weight gain, insomnia, memory issues, headaches, anxiety, depression, incontinence, and hair loss are common issues women face as they age and are not necessarily related to menopause. But no matter what is causing your symptoms, hormonal changes or aging or both, don't worry. We will work to address your issues. Okay, the climacterium or the loss of reproductive ability happens much later for men than it does for women, um, and some men never experience it. But when they do, it's called andropause, or um, on the streets, it's often called menopause. But it is the male change of life, and we see that um, the levels of testosterone decline in men, but very slowly, generally. And we see that as men age, their libido, which is um, their conscious experience of their sexuality, um, how aroused they are, or their desire for sex, um, as well as the potency, which is the physical capacity to react to sexual stimuli, um, in other words, the ability to get an erection, both of these things, libido and potency, can lessen with andropause. However, we find that generally um, erectile dysfunction is caused by the central nervous system slowing in very few cases and more often is uh, caused by a self-fulfilling prophecy. Thinking that you are not going to be able to get an erection leads to not being able to get an erection way more than any physical cause. So there's actually not a lot of evidence for uh, menopause or andropause as it relates to those hormonal and emotional changes that we see in women. Um, however, it is a controversial and often discussed topic. So let's go ahead and watch a video now on this idea of andropause. Andropause is something that happens to men as they age when their testosterone levels begin dropping. The symptoms of andropause vary depending on the guy. Some fellows report having lower energy or even feeling depressed. Others 
feel their heart rates fluctuate, or they sometimes experience trouble sleeping. The reason that you don't often hear the term andropause is partly because many men are reluctant to discuss the symptoms, in particular, loss of libido and less rigid <clears throat> erections. It's usually just not something men are eager to talk about with other guys. The medical community is still trying to understand andropause, and there are differences of opinion about it. Some believe that environmental estrogens are playing a part in what appears to be an increase in the cases of earlier onset of andropause, and some doctors are prescribing bioavailable hormones. Others believe that there are certain foods and nutritional supplements and even particular exercises that encourage the body to increase its own natural production of testosterone. Longevity lifestyle is a new expression that conveys the recent trend toward a more holistic approach to andropause, the factors and solutions for body, mind, and spirit. If you are a male over the age of 40, then testosterone and your own body's ability to naturally produce it is more valuable to you than gold. If you want to improve your health, stop thinking of testosterone as just a sex hormone. It's much, much more than that. Seek out your healthcare professional, be curious and proactive in your own virility, and visit instantdane.tv daily for useful and interesting features. A lot of people believe that intelligence declines with age, but actually it's a little bit more complicated than just a simple yes or no answer. So there's two types of intelligence. There's fluid intelligence and crystallized intelligence that are particularly affected by age. Fluid intelligence involves information processing ca capabilities, reasoning, memory, um, it's more of a general kind of intelligence, like the ability to solve an analogy or remember numbers or rapidly solve a puzzle. Um, and it depends on the proper functioning of the nervous system. There's also crystallized intelligence, which is the accumulation of information, skills, strategies that are learned through life experience and then are applied in problem-solving situations. Uh, generally, we test for crystallized intelligence with verbal ability tasks and um, cultural knowledge, like who was the president in 1950. And so crystallized intelligence relies on long-term mem uh, memory and is a reflection of the culture in which you were raised. So being able to participate, participate in a discussion on finding a solution to poverty, for example, would be crystallized intelligence. So we know that fluid intelligence um, often decreases with age, whereas crystallized does not and usually stays stable, or in some cases, crystallized even increases. So this is why we find that the best work in history, philosophy, and psychology happens in later adulthood when you're using your crystallized intelligence, and it's getting, in some cases, better with age. And then fluid intelligence decreases by 3 to 7 IQ points per decade, which is why we see the best advancements in math, music, and chemistry occur um, at a younger age. Some individuals decline in fluid intelligence um, significantly, but not all. And the decline in IQ usually happens later in life, usually after the age of 60. Let's watch a short video on the difference between fluid and crystallized intelligence. Aging is a natural process, and with it come changes in memory. Most people associate aging with declines in cognitive performance. My mom will say she's having a senior moment when she forgets something, for example. But never fear, not all cognitive changes in adulthood are negative. Some abilities remain relatively stable, and some even improve. So let's start with the positive. Abilities that remain stable. First of all, implicit memory stays about the same across the lifespan. In other words, once you've learned to ride a bike, that procedural memory is likely to stay with you as you age, barring any brain damage or disease. 
Recognition memory also stays relatively stable over time, meaning that once you learn something, your ability to pick it out of a list later remains about the same whether you're 27 or 67. Now for abilities that improve. Semantic memory improves until around age 60 and only then starts declining. This means that older adults still have good verbal skills and why they make excellent crossword puzzle buddies. A related area in which older adults tend to score better than younger adults is crystallized intelligence, which involves the ability to use knowledge and experience. Since older adults have had more time to gain knowledge and experience, this pattern makes sense. And crystallized intelligence is often tested with reading comprehension and analogy tests, so older adults tend to be better at those than younger adults. Finally, older adults tend to be better at reasoning in the face of interpersonal or emotionally charged problems. Again, the theory is that with their greater experience and knowledge of these types of situations, they're more likely to have been through some similar situation and be able to draw from that experience. Of course, there are some cognitive abilities that decline as we age. Recall becomes more difficult. Although recognition is stable, it's harder for older adults than younger adults to generate responses without cues, like there are in a free recall or sometimes cued recall test. Similarly, episodic memory is impaired. Often, memories formed a long time ago will be relatively stable, but forming new episodic memories becomes more difficult as we age. Processing speed slows down as we age, so if you're watching Jeopardy with Grandma, she might know just as many answers as you do, if not more, but she'll have a harder time outputting the response within such a short period of time. Related to processing speed, divided attention becomes more difficult. As we age, it becomes increasingly harder to effectively switch our attention between tasks, so we become more easily distracted. The bottom line is that cognitive changes in adulthood aren't all negative. Although some cognitive abilities do decline, it's important to remember that in healthy older adults, some cognitive abilities will remain stable or even improve. There are, however, some alternative theories to the relationship between intelligence and aging. For example, um, psychologist Sternberg believed that the following three types of intelligence actually peak during middle adulthood. And they are analytical, creative, and practical intelligence. So analytic intelligence is assessed by intelligence tests that have well-defined problems having a single right answer. For example, a math problem. Then there is creative intelligence, and this is demonstrated in reacting adaptively to novel situations and novel ideas. For example, what can you do with a newspaper? And coming up with a bunch of responses, none of which are read it, would indicate creative intelligence. The next one is practical intelligence, which according to Sternberg is intelligence related to the overall success in living. Traditional um, intelligence tests generally do not measure career success, which is very different from academic success because it has to do with who you know and uh, how you interact with people in the workplace and how quickly you get work done and a variety of other factors that aren't really measured in academic SAT tests, for example. We see that people that are high on practical intelligence are quick to learn norms and principles, um, particularly in the workplace, and then apply them appropriately. So they know who to talk to, they know when to hang out around the water co uh, cooler, so to speak. And then there is another um, psychologist that researcher, uh, researches intelligence, and his name is Howard Gardner. And he argues that there are eight different types of intelligence, and they include um, naturalistic intelligence, which are like your Bear grills, your survivor man, the people that just have a way with nature. Uh, musical intelligence, which is the ability to quickly um, memorize music, the ability to compose music, to play musical instruments. Um, discern sound, pitch, tone, rhythm very easily. And then there is logical mathematical, which is um, very scientific in nature, quantifying things, making hypotheses, proving them, being good at math. 
Then there is existential intelligence, which is um, the ability to philosophize about questions regarding why we are here, what the purpose of life is, what happens after we die, why we die. The next type of intelligence is interpersonal, and this is the ability to um, connect with other people, being able to sense other people's feelings, their emotions, their um, intentions, being able to read others really well. Then there's bodily kinesthetic, and this is the ability to um, coordinate your mind with your body, like in sports or in dance. The next one is linguistic, which is being word smart, having a good vocabulary, being able to use words um, in a way that is very efficient at expressing your thoughts. The next one is intrapersonal, and this is being self-aware, understanding what makes you tick, uh, why you behave the way you behave, why you feel and think the way you think and feel. Um, and then the last one is spatial intelligence, which is being able to visualize the world in 3D. Generally, people high in visual intelligence are artists or architects. They're good at packing. Um, they have a sense of space and how things are related in space. So Gardner says that we are generally smart um, in one, two, possibly even three of these types of intelligence, and that we all are smart in different ways. So the question then is not um, how smart are you, but instead he asks how are you smart? So to hear more on Gardner's theory of intelligence, let's watch a video clip of him describing it. We have schools because we hope that someday when children have left schools that they will still be able to use what it is that they've learned. And there is now a massive amount of evidence from all realms of science that unless individuals take a very active role in what it is that they're studying, unless they learn to ask questions, to do things hands-on, to essentially recreate things in their own mind and then transform them as is needed, the the, the ideas just disappear. The student may have a good grade on the exam, we may think that he or she is learning, but a year or two later, there's nothing left. If, on the other hand, somebody has carried out an experiment himself or herself, analyzed the data, made a prediction and saw whether it, it came out correctly, if somebody is doing history and actually does some interviewing himself or herself, oral histories, then reads the documents, listens to it, go back and asks further questions, writes up a paper. That's the kind of thing that's going to adhere, where if you simply memorize a bunch of names and a bunch of facts and a bunch of, even a bunch of, uh, of, of definitions, there's nothing to hold on to. The idea of multiple intelligences comes out of psychology. It's a theory that was developed to document the fact that human beings have very different kinds of intellectual strengths, and that these strengths are very, very important in how kids learn and how people represent things in their minds and then how people use them in order to show what it is that they've understood. If we all had exactly the same kind of mind and there was only one kind of intelligence, then we could teach everybody the same thing in the same way and assess them in the same way, and that would be fair. But once we realize that people have very different kinds of minds, different kinds of strengths, some people are good in thinking spatially, some people are good in thinking language, other people are very logical, other people need to do hands-on, they need to actually explore actively and to try things out. Once we realize that, then a education which treats everybody the same way is actually the most unfair education because it picks out one kind of mind, which I call the law professor mind, somebody who's very linguistic and logical, and says, if you think like that, great. If you don't think like that, there's no room in the train for you. If we know that one child has a very spatial or visual spatial way of learning, another child has a very hands-on way of learning, a third child likes to ask deep philosophical questions, a fourth child likes stories. We don't have to talk very fast as a teacher. We can actually provide software, we can provide materials, we can provide resources, which present material to a child in a way in which the child will find interesting and will be able to use his or her intelligences productively and to the extent that the technology is interactive, the child will actually be, actually be able to show his or her understanding in a way that's comfortable to the child. We have this myth that the only way to learn something is read it in a textbook or hear a lecture on it, and the only way to show 
that we've understood something is to take a short answer test or maybe occasionally with an essay question thrown in. But that's nonsense. Everything can be taught in more than one way, and anything that's understood can be shown in more than one way. I don't believe because there are eight intelligences we have to teach things eight ways. I think that's silly. But we always ought to be asking to ourselves, are we reaching every child, and if not, are there other ways in which we can do it? I think that we teach way too many subjects, and we cover way too much material, and the end result is that students have a very superficial knowledge, as we often say, a mile wide and an inch deep, and then once they leave school, almost everything's been forgotten. And I think that school needs to change to have a few priorities and to really go into those priorities very deeply. So let's take the area of science. I actually don't care if a child studies physics or biology or geology or astronomy before he goes to college. There's plenty of time to do that kind of detailed work. I think what's really important is to begin to learn to think scientifically, to understand what a hypothesis is, how to test it out and see whether it's working or not. If it's not working, how to revise your theory about things. That takes time. There's no way you can present that in a week or indeed even in a month. You have to learn about it from doing many different kinds of experiments, seeing when the results are like what you predicted, seeing when they're different, and so on. But if you really focus on science in that kind of way, by the time you, you go to college, or if you don't go to college, by the time you go to workplace, you'll know the difference between a statement which is simply a matter of opinion or prejudice and one for which there's solid evidence. The most important thing about assessment is knowing what it is that you should be able to do. And the best way for me to think about it is a child learning a sport or a child learning an art form. Because there it's completely unmysterious what you have to be to be a quarterback or a figure skater or a violin player. You see it, you try it out, you're coached, you know when you're getting better, you know how you're doing compared to other kids. In school, assessment is mystifying. Nobody knows what's going to be on the test. And when the test results go back, neither the teacher nor the student knows what to do. So what I favor is highlighting for kids from the day they walk into school, what are the performances and what are the exhibitions for which they're going to be accountable. Let's get real. Let's look at the kinds of things that we really value in the world. Let's be as explicit as we can. Let's provide feedback to kids from as early as possible. And then let them internalize the feedback so they themselves can say what's going well, what's not going so well. I'm a writer, and initially I had to have a lot of feedback from editors, including a lot of rejections. But over time, I learned what was important. I learned to edit myself. And now the, re the, the feedback from editors is much less necessary. And I think anybody as an adult knows that as you get to be more expert in things, you don't have to do so much external critiquing. You can do what we call self-assessment. And in school, assessment shouldn't be something that's done to you. It should be something where you are the most active agent. I think for there to be long-standing change in American education that uh, is widespread rather than just on the margins. First of all, people have to see examples of places which are like their own places where the new kind of education really works, where students are learning deeply, where they can exhibit their knowledge publicly, and where everybody who looks at the kids says, that's the kind of kids I want to have. So we need to have enough good examples. Second of all, we need to have the individuals who are involved in education, primarily teachers and administrators, believe in this, really want to do it, and get the kind of help that they need in order to be able to switch, so to speak, from a teacher-centered, um, let's stuff it into the kid's mind kind of education to one where the preparation is behind the scenes and the child himself or herself is at the center of learning. Third of all, I think we need to have assessment schemes which really convince everybody that this kind of education is working. It, it does no good to have child-centered learning and then have the same old multiple choice tests which were used 50 or 100 years ago. Uh, finally, I think there has to be a political commitment which says that this is kind of education which we want to have in our country and maybe outside this country for the foreseeable future. And as long as people are busy bashing teachers or saying that we can't try anything new because it might fail, then reform will be stifled as it has been in the past. For more information on what works in public education, go to edutopia.org. Okay, go ahead and pause the video here.
Go over to Moodle Complete Lecture Activity 1. When you finish that, return to this point in the video. See you then. So when we study creativity in adulthood, we find some um, commonalities amongst highly creative adults. And those are that they plan and make decisions on their own. They prefer to work alone and generally don't want any feedback. Um, they're optimistic about challenging complex tasks, so they like a challenge. They embrace it like it's a puzzle. Um, they generate more ideas than others, uh, many of which are actually made fun of when we observe them, like in the workplace, for example. However, some of them tend to uh, work out. Another one is that they don't listen to criticisms. They tend to be resourceful. In other words, if they don't know the answer, they know how to find it. They're tolerant of uncertainty and amb ambiguity, um, the gray area. They're fine with not knowing a definitive answer. They're generally not the smartest or best in competitions because generally they're not competitive by nature. They often use an imaginative vocabulary um, they're flexible in their thought process, meaning they're open-minded and willing to consider different ideas. They elaborate on tasks, so they don't just search for the bottom line or the easy way out, but they often go above and beyond and um, consider all the avenues within a project or within a work assignment. And they often produce original ideas, which is one of the main components of creativity. One study found that scholars and scientists are most creative during the ages of 40 and 60. And there's actually little creative output in the 20s. And um, the study also found that artists peak in creativity at age 40, but there's really not much of a difference in creativity between 60 and 70. So if you're an artist, just know that your sweet spot is going to be between the ages of 40 and 60. Okay, so let's look at learning ability in middle adulthood and answer the question, does our ability to learn decline as we age? So there's a lot of controversy over this question, actually. Um, some studies have shown that as we get older, we are not as good at remembering um, certain skills, specifically word associations. In other words, pairs of words. For example, one study showed people two lists of words and tells them word associations and then later asks them to recall. Uh, so for example, remember that pear goes with penguin and that cat goes with cucumber and make these word associations in your mind. And then later, hours later, come back and say, okay, what word goes with pear? What word goes with cucumber? And so um, the ability to make associations is an important skill in life. However, we find that generally um, in middle adulthood, uh, these people scored poorly on these word association tasks. So if you really need to win a game, play a 50-year-old and password, and you're pretty much guaranteed that win. Okay, uh, studies show that this um, decrease in learning ability may be due to speed of response. Uh, for example, in time trials, middle adults often time out, taking too long to recall the word association. Um, studies show that this um, lack of learning ability may also be due to uh, a lack of motivation to learn. They tend to show anxiety when we're testing them in the lab. They may consider the task meaningless uh, not important, which negatively affects motivation, obviously. But we do know that there are more middle adults returning to school than ever before and doing well. And some of the reasons for this might be that um, there's new technology and computers and um, women are encouraged to get education now, whereas they weren't before. Um, another reason that they may not be be so good at learning is omission error, which is when they think they are wrong, they just don't say anything. But when asked to say what they thought the right answer was, for example, in the word association test, what did you think went with cucumber? They usually get it right. So it's kind of about doubting themselves as well. Okay, so imagine that you had started a business in the 70s or the late 60s. And when you um, hired people, 
they were very young, uh, 18, 16, 17 years old, and now um, they're getting to be much older. What would it be like for you as the employer to have most of your employees be in middle adulthood versus young adulthood? Well, this scenario is kind of happening now. Um, there was a generation of baby boomers where a lot of people were coming home from the war and making babies. Um, and so there was a spike in the population. Well, now those baby boomers, um, or the products of the baby boom, are now entering their middle adulthood. And since there are so many of them, they have really dominated the job market. And this actually does leave very little work for younger adults. It's getting harder and harder for people graduating college to find jobs. And it's also creating a different work environment for employers. For example, now they have to find new ways to train and develop uh, the middle adulthood workers that pertain to their age-related issues. In the old days, employers used to uh, train young new hires, but now they're having to uh, redo the way that they train and what they're using their training programs for. And so new forms of training that were seen in the workplace to accommodate middle adulthood is continuing education, seminars, workshops, degree programs to help the baby boomers or the middle adults keep up with the latest in education and technology. Some of the training topics include awareness of physical and psychological issues related to aging and death, uh, so very age appropriate for the employer's workforce. And those topics might include talking about life insurance, heart disease, cancer, other training topics include evaluating your goals, your career goals, and developing new ones. Um, skills being outdated is a common training topic as that's occurring for a lot of the workforce. Uh, family conflict is another common training topic that we're seeing arise in the workplace. And feelings of decreased job mobility and concerns about job um, security, feeling like you're going to be offered a buyout so that the company can hire a younger employee, for example. One study found that feeling trusted by our managers makes us feel like our work is meaningful and empowering. Um, this study also found that feeling like our work is important makes us have nicer, warmer interactions with others. And um, another study found that women who have jobs that make them feel in control actually have less stress. And so we know that women managers tend to have higher self-esteem, which usually results in um, a better marriage life, unless their husband is threatened by their title and their salary. Um, then it can have the reverse effect and actually cause problems in um, the marriage. So these are all issues that um, people in middle adulthood face at work. But let's go ahead and watch a video that discusses more in depth the effect of the baby boomers on the workplace. We all know the population is getting older and that the first of the big generation are reaching what traditionally has been deemed the age of retirement. But the subtitle of your book is kind of uh, surprising. I mean, you say, the aging of the world's population and how it pits young against old, child against parent, worker against boss, company against rival, and nation against nation. I mean, it almost sounds like some kind of apocryphal Hobbesian war that uh, that we're confronting. What's what's your main point in this book? What's your major thesis? Well, my main idea, Alan, is that this is a huge change. And when there's a big change, there's a lot of competition. Uh, there's a competition for status. There's a competition for resources, for attention, for happiness. Um, you know, the book started because I had this idea based on the book I wrote on China, China, Inc., that uh, the countries where that had an aging workforce uh, and a mature workforce, uh, Europe, East Asia, outside of China, the United States, were making older workers very, very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. uh, one of the most vulnerable class of workers right now is the 50-plus worker. And then when I traveled to China, I saw that you know here was this perhaps two trillion dollars worth of global capital flowing into Chinese cities, attracting almost entirely young people to this new urban industrial 21st century wonderland. And I was wondering whether the declining status of the older people in the places I lived uh, in the American Midwest 
uh, the places I traveled to in Europe and elsewhere in East Asia, whether they were connected to this thriving new environment for youth in China. So was there a kind of massive, global, unremitting age discrimination going on? What's causing this, this aging? I mean, is it policy driven or cultural or what, what is, what's behind it? Well, globally, there's two things that are causing uh, the world to age. Uh, the number one thing is that we're adding years to human life. Uh, so in the developed world, we're adding between one and a half and two and a half years every single decade. You know, in, in the half hour that you and I will talk, we're both getting an extra seven and a half minutes of life. Um, <laughs> thank you for that. Yes. <laughs> um, and uh, that's a huge boon, but that's not the biggest thing that's making places older. So you and I age day by day, but a place ages based on the average age of the people. And that changes based on how many children people have. Mm -hmm. And it's really the huge decline in fertility around the world that is aging the world. You also talk, uh, and it's interesting because I haven't really seen this before, is that this aging population will accelerate the pace of globalization. Expand on that for me. Yeah, so th think of it this way. So if uh, some Canadian manufacturers uh, are facing global competition from other companies that are moving to China in low-cost places, um, they think hard uh, where they can outsource to. And if part of their balance sheet is weighed down by the pensions they have to provide their employees. Which we're seeing time and time again. Uh, then they will look for places that are not encumbered by those age-related expenses. You call this it's almost an age arbitrage going on by companies as they look around the world finding those low-cost, younger cost centers. It can be brutal. So when you uh, say, okay, we're going to shed the manufacturing jobs here in Canada and we're going to go get them in China or Vietnam, who do you hire? You don't hire all the hardest working people. You don't hire all of the smartest people. You hire the young people who are not encumbered by those expenses. And you don't give them those benefits. So there are factories in China. They make iPods. They make Hewlett Packard computers. They make all of the things that fill our material life. Um, one of them is a co famous company called Foxconn. Mm -hmm. uh, it had 900,000 employees last year. It will have 1.3 million employees this one year. One company. One company. How would you like to add just 1.3 million jobs to the economy of Canada? That would be huge. Um, so this is one company. You walk into a factory like that, and the thing you notice first is that everyone is young. That mm. is the most essential fact of their employment. Well, let's get into that a little bit more, because you make the point in the very near future, we will for the first time, as, as, as long as we've chronicled mm -hmm. human history, have more people over the age of 50 than under the age of, uh, of 17. I mean, yes, what never are the, happened. What are the global implications for that? Um, well, they're enormous. You know, so what I tried to do in the book is I tried to show how this changed changes everything about you. And I actually believe that this demographic change is more important than the fundamental economics of the world, than climate change, than uh, global warming. This is what informs all of those things. Uh, when, when you get the ship, people start thinking differently about their lifespan. They start thinking differently about how they treat their children. Uh, they need their children to be educated for a long life of work, not just a young life of toil. Um, and, you know, the biggest fear in the industrial world right now uh, in uh, polls that have come out this year is that people are desperately afraid that they will run out of money uh, before they run out of years. Basically. Now, we should make the point, because I want to talk about Spain, because you focus on it a yeah. lot in the book. This is the, this is the one country that's aging more rapidly and more alarmingly than yes. virtually any other country in the world. It is. You know, so now older people, you know, the, the, the products of these smaller families will turn back, say, I, I come from a family where we really rely on family support. You turn around and there's no family there. And that's why the immigrants are flooding in, um, because the family size has shrunk so dramatically and Spain has reached this inflection point where it's aging. Um, so one of the things that's happened uh, is that uh, with this huge influx of uh, migrant workers uh, and the leading edge migrants into Spain are women in care jobs to support an aging population. Yet in Spain there's still a huge well-educated youth population who are unemployed. You know, what, what's going on there? You know, I, I said that um, families will pay for the education of their kids, mm -hmm. but once they pay for the education of their kids, they don't want them to do stoop labor. Right and they will support them until they can find a job 
that is commensurate with the dignity they wanted to bestow on their children with the education. It's a treasure that the parents may not have had, and they don't want the kids to be put in a position where they're squandering it. So they hang back in the job market, and this is true in Japan, it's true in Italy, it's true in Spain, and it's even true increasingly um, among my friends, you know, who uh, have the son or daughter who moves back in until they can get the job that their university education well, matches. And we're, and we're seeing that. I mean, there's a huge increase in the number of 20-year-olds who live with uh, their parents. I mean, I saw research the other day that 58% of Canadian baby boomers have a financial responsibility for an adult child. What happens to the tax base of a country when all the new jobs are low-paying immigrants and that you have these relatively well-educated but not particularly productive adult children? Um, you know, well, that's a really interesting question because one of the reasons why you want immigrants is so that they change your dependency ratio. Immigrants come in, they tend to have bigger families, they tend to be younger overall, and in a way we're kind of using them as the support for our aging white populations. Right. Um, but, you know, there's an, another thing that, that happens in, in this dynamic, which is that the, the kids that hang back, um, you know, they have been educated to have a better life, but when there's this gap in their employment, uh, they lose the compounding of skills and money mm -hmm. over their lifetime. You say that, that this, this demographic reality is going to lead to a generational conflict. Where do you see that happening and how do you see it managed? Well, I see it in the workplace, certainly in the workplace. Um, you know, for the f one of the things that's happening in the workforce, which is uh, making older workers vulnerable, is that it's coming at a time when the older workers are really worried about their long-term financial viability. So if, if I, at age 53, lose my company job, uh, I lose those years where I'm really hurrying up to try and fill my pension plan, uh, fill my savings for the long term. For If I reach 60, I have a very high probability of making it to 90 or 95. Yes, uh, a stunning probability if yeah. you're healthy at 60. Right. 65. A child born in France today has a 50-50 chance of making it to 100. So th if I am an employer and I'm thinking, am I going to move jobs to China and am I going to give job to an 18-year-old at home who will have four jobs by the time he, he's 30, or am I going to give it to a desperate 53-year-old who will have the job, who will keep hold on to that job for dear life until he's in his early 70s? Who do I pick? And this is the competition. Well, so we know that women are working more than ever before. So let's take a look at some of the common challenges for the working woman. And there are four common challenges that affect uh, women more than they do men. And the first is sexual harassment. So there's different types of sexual harassment. And it's um, reported that generally people don't file a complaint when they are harassed at work. And one of the main reasons they don't is because they're not sure if what happened to them constitutes sexual harassment. So really anything that makes you feel uncomfortable and has a sexual connotation or is in regards to your gender or sexual orientation all falls under the umbrella of sexual harassment. But some examples of that might be sexual suggestions, jokes, propositions, especially propositions involving threats. For example, if you don't go out with me, I'm going to demote you. Um, leering, looking at you creepily, accidentally, in air quotes, rubbing against you, um, pats, massages, squeezes, pinches, questions about your sex life. All of this constitutes sexual harassment. Even um, explicit pictures or sexually suggestive pictures on someone's desk can constitute um, sexual harassment. So typical responses to sexual harassment are to avoid the fact that you've been harassed, deny, um, and then advocacy seeking. So go around the office and ask other women, for example, if the boss has also sexually harassed them. Um, generally, women often conclude that they were not sexually harassed when they were, but they do display poor morale at work and have higher job satisfaction when they have been victims but have not reported it. So we are going to watch a video on uh, sexual harassment that goes more in depth on what exactly constitutes sexual harassment and what your options are if you feel like you've been victimized.
Ali Tomlin never had a real job before. At 17, she decided she wanted to find out what the world of work was all about. Bye, see you later. Bye, see you Good luck with your she was talking to a friend at school who happened to work at Jamba Juice, a national chain of stores that sells juices and smoothies. I was like, yeah, you know, I really think I'm going to start getting a job. I kind of want my own money now. He mentioned I'm a team lead at Jamba Juice, and right now I know we're hiring. I was like, oh, awesome. She got the job at this Jamba Juice in the town of Puyallup, just outside of Seattle, Washington. It was a very busy, very kind of hectic environment, so I was like, oh, fast-paced, my kind of thing. You thought working at Jamba Juice was going to be fun. Yeah, a fun first job. But it wasn't all fun. At first, her manager made her feel a little uncomfortable, but that would lead to something worse. He gave me what I call the woolies. Like, I watched the way he interacted with the other team members, like, very close. And when he talked to you, he needed to be here. He needed to set his hand on your shoulder. And I was like... That's weird, so I just did my best to kind of stay away from him. So at what point did it go from a manager giving you the willies to a manager who was then trying to harass you? It was a like series of steps. When he, I felt the first step was when he started making inappropriate comments, like little joking comments and like putting his arm around you and things like that. And then he would make comments about like your boob size. And like, he was like, oh, Ali, yeah, I grabbed my arm. Come on, I'm gonna take you in the back and bend you over, I'll show you what's going on. So it was like when he really, his comments got a little vulgar, but then when he started to like physically touch me, like he physically grabbed, reached out, grabbed my arm and pulled me with all his weight. Then I was like, wow, no, that's not okay. Ali's manager was 32 years old, almost twice her age. She says he made jokes about her bra size and her weight, talked about masturbation, and showed Ali a photo of his wife in a thong. But Ali says no one else at the store seemed to think that the manager was doing anything inappropriate. But it was always like we were reassured. That's just his behavior. That's just how he acts. It was just a joke. I was like... I don't think that's the way things are supposed to go, but I'm not, you know, I didn't know enough about the way it works. So I was like, okay. So did you come home and tell your mom? No, because I knew that if I came home and I told my mom and my dad right away that they would make me quit. And I, it was like my first job and I really liked it. And I was kind of like, in my head, I was like, if I stay away from him and keep my distance, then everything's okay. Ali Tomlin's story is not an isolated case. Every year, millions of teenagers get jobs in stores, restaurants, movie theaters. They're often part-time workers, the lowest paid with the least amount of work experience. And all of those factors makes them more vulnerable to sexual harassment on the job. They're completely disposable. They can be replaced tomorrow, especially in a climate like ours right now. The, there's 10 kids to take the job if they leave. They have no power whatsoever. E.J. Graff is a senior researcher with the Schuster Institute for Investigative Journalism at Brandeis University. After hearing about some of these cases, she began her own investigation to find out just how prevalent teen harassment is. Are we talking about dozens, maybe hundreds? Hundreds of thousands of teens who are being assaulted, just sexually assaulted on the job. Based on studies of the workplace, Graf estimates that about 400,000 teenagers are being sexually harassed at work every year. And Ali Tomlin is just one of those thousands of cases. Ali had been working at Jamba Juice for five months, doing the best she could to avoid her manager. But one day, she couldn't get away. Ali says she was in the back of the store counting money for the cash register. And he walked up behind me, like really like really close, I would say maybe like five, six inches away from me and just stood really close and then kind of like leaned over my shoulder and he was like, hey, Ali, want to see something funny? And you wear teen t-shirts there. It's like a t-shirt with an apron. Apparently there was a little hole about the size of a dime in the back of the t-shirt and he uh, stuck his hands in it and completely ripped the shirt off me. And um, when I spun around, the shirt was completely torn and was like hanging out of my jeans. Allie says it looked like she had nothing on but her apron, and she stood there in shock. 
Her manager then took out his cell phone and took a picture of her. Everybody was laughing and I just kind of stood there and I got really quiet and really withdrawn and I was like fighting back tears and I was like, I just want to go home. Allie decided she had had enough and put in her two weeks notice. She finally told her parents what was going on at work. When she told you about the harassment, the touching mm -hmm. by her supervisor, what were you thinking at that point? I was pissed, to be blunt. You know, a mom wants to protect their kids from things like that. So i um, really upset. The assistant manager found out about what happened and asked Allie to come back to work. She told Allie that the manager's behavior violated their sexual harassment policy and he would get fired. I was like, oh my God, ideal situation. If he goes, then I'll definitely stay, but I'm not working with him. And? He didn't go. <laughs> I went. Okay, so another um, gender issue is pay and promotion. We know that women are paid less for doing the same exact job and having the same exact qualifications as a man and also are promoted less than men are when they have the same exact abilities and experience. Um, some explanations for the pay and promotion discrepancy between genders are that uh, there's male prejudice. Um, women might have more absences due to children. Women have more anxiety about computers, research shows, so they might be considered less qualified because of that. Um, and women take less math courses than men do. And so maybe this constitutes a qualification or lack of ability that's observed by their boss. Um, in 1963, the Equal Pay Act passed, but women to this day are still paid less than men and promoted less than men. Another issue is work-family conflict, and this is the phenomenon that occurs when a woman's roles as a mother, wife, and worker spill over into one another, creating that conflict. And so the work-family conflict creates a lot of stress. Women who have family support, though, generally experience less stress from work-family conflict. Um, women that have what we call a hardy personality, which means that they have a need for control, commitment, and they embrace challenge, generally experience less stress. And um, we also find that better work supervisor relationships also help to decrease work family conflict, um, but often causes more work spillover at home. Um, their boss is often understanding and uh, will give them more flexibility and leniency, but this can often cause the worker to have to bring work to their house um, after office hours. Let's watch a TED Talk on how to find some work-family balance. <laughs> What I thought I would do is I would start with a, a simple request. Uh, I'd like all of you to, to pause for a moment, you wretched weaklings, uh, and take stock of your miserable existence. <laughs> now, that was the advice that St. Benedict gave his rather startled followers uh, in the 5th century. Uh, and it was the advice that I decided to follow myself when I turned 40. Up until that moment, I had been that classic corporate warrior. I was eating too much, I was drinking too much, I was working too hard, and I was neglecting the family. Uh, and I decided that I would try and turn my life around. In particular, I decided I would try to address the thorny issue of work-life balance. So I, I stepped back from the workforce, and I spent a year at home with my wife and four young children. But all I learned about work-life balance from that year was that I found it quite easy to balance work and life when I didn't have any work. 
Not a very useful skill, uh, especially when the, when the money runs out. Um, so I went back to work. And I've spent the seven years since struggling with, studying, and writing about work-life balance. And I have four observations I'd like to share with you uh, today. The first is if society is to make any progress on this issue, we, we need an honest debate. But the trouble is, so many people talk so much rubbish about work-life balance. All the discussions about flexi time, or dress down Fridays, or paternity leave, only serve to mask the core issue, which is that certain job and career choices are fundamentally incompatible with being meaningfully engaged on a day-to-day -day basis with a young family. Now, the first step in solving any problem is acknowledging the reality of the situation you're in. And the reality of the society that we're in is there are thousands and thousands of people out there leading lives of quiet, screaming desperation, where they work long, hard hours at jobs they hate to enable them to buy things they don't need to impress people they don't like. <laughs> And it's my contention that going to work on a Friday in jeans and T-shirt isn't really getting to the nub of the issue. <laughs> the second observation I'd like to make is we need to face the truth that governments and corporations aren't going to solve this issue for us. We should stop looking outside. It's up to us as individuals to take control and responsibility for the type of lives that we want to lead. If you don't design your life, someone else will design it for you, and you may just not like their idea of balance. It's particularly important, this isn't on the World Wide Web, is it? I'm about to get fired. It's particularly important that you never put the quality of your life in the hands of a commercial corporation. Now, I'm not talking here just about the bad companies, the, the abattoirs of the human soul, as I call them. <laughs> I'm talking about all companies, because commercial companies are inherently designed to get as much out of you as they can get away with. It's in their nature, it's in their DNA, it's what they do, even the good, well-intentioned companies. On the one hand, putting childcare facilities in the workplace is wonderful and enlightened. On the other hand, it's a nightmare that just means you spend more time at the bloody office. We have to be responsible for setting and enforcing the boundaries that we want in our life. The third observation is we have to be careful with the time frame that we choose upon which to judge our balance. Before I went back to work, after my year at home, I, I sat down and I wrote out a detailed step-by-step description of the ideal balanced day that I aspired to. And it went like this. Wake up well rested after a good night's sleep. Have sex. <laughs> Walk the dog. Have breakfast with my wife and children. Have sex again. <laughs> Drive the kids to school on the way to the office. Do three hours work, play sport with a friend at lunchtime. Do another three hours work. Meet some mates in the pub for an early evening drink. Drive home for dinner with my wife and kids. Meditate for half an hour. Have sex. Walk the dog. Have sex again. Go to bed. How often do you think I had that day? <laughs> uh, we, we need to be realistic. You can't do it all in one day. We need to elongate the time frame upon which we judge the balance in our life. But we need to elongate it without falling into the trap of the I'll have a life when I retire. 
When my kids have left home, when my wife has divorced me, my health is failing, I've got no mates or interests left. <laughs> a day is too short, after I retire is too long. There's got to be a middle way. A fourth observation. We need to approach balance in a balanced way. A friend came to see me last year, and she doesn't mind me telling the story. A friend came to see me last year and said, Nigel, I've read your book, and I realise that my life is completely out of balance. It's totally dominated by work. I work 10 hours a day, I commute two hours a day. All my relationships have failed. There's nothing in my life apart from my work. So I've decided to get a grip and sort it out. So I've joined a gym. <laughs> Now, I don't mean to mock, but being a fit 10 hour a day office rat isn't more balanced, it's more fit. <laughs> Lovely, though physical exercise may be, there are other parts to life. There's the intellectual side, there's the emotional side, there's the spiritual side. And to be balanced, I believe we have to attend to all of those areas, not just do 50 stomach crunches. Now, that can be daunting, because people say, bloody hell, mate, I haven't got time to get fit. You want me to go to church and call my mother? <laughs> and I understand, I, I truly understand how that can be daunting. But an incident that happened a couple of years ago gave me a new perspective. My wife, who is somewhere in the audience uh, today, called me up at the office and said, Nigel, you need to pick our younger son up, Harry, from school. She had to be somewhere else with the other three children for that evening. So I left work an hour early that afternoon and picked Harry up at the school gates. We walked down to the local park, messed around on the swings, played some silly games. I then walked him up the hill to the local cafe and we shared a pizza for tea. Then walked down the hill to our home uh, and I gave him his bath and put him in his Batman pyjamas. I then read him a chapter of Roald Dahl's James and the Giant Peach. I then put him to bed, tucked him in, gave him a kiss on his forehead and said, good night, mate, and walked out of his bedroom. As I was walking out of his bedroom, he said, Dad, I went, yes, mate. He went, Dad, this has been the best day of my life, <laughs> ever. I hadn't done anything. I hadn't taken him to Disney World or bought him a PlayStation. Now, my point is, the small things matter. Being more balanced doesn't mean dramatic upheaval in your life. With the smallest investment in the right places, you can radically transform the quality of your relationships and the quality of your life. Moreover, I think it can transform society. Because if enough people do it, we can change society's definition of success away from the moronically simplistic notion that the person with the most money when he dies wins, to a more thoughtful and balanced definition of what a life well lived looks like. And that, I think, is an idea worth spreading. And then if um, a job requires a woman to travel, there can be some safety concerns we know that women working outside the home are more likely to be victims of crimes than men and um, more likely to be victims than women working in the home. Okay, go ahead and pause the video here. Head on over to Moodle and complete lecture activity number two. When you finish that, return to this point in the video. See you then. Another common occurrence in middle adulthood is what's called the mid-career crisis. This is a stage that some people go through in middle age during which they come to question their career, their personal goal, and their life dreams. It's actually different than a midlife crisis, which we'll talk about in the next chapter, which is caused by awareness of advancing age, death of parents, decrease in physical ability, your kids moving out. So the mid-career crisis is um, related specifically to your career. 
One of the things that uh, we want to see happen with if a mid-career crisis occurs is coming to terms with attainable career goals. So by the time we are 40, we have a better idea of if we are going to make it to the top of our field or not. So we tend to adjust our career goals or we start over. Coming to terms with these career goals can be a really good thing um, because it allows you to have realistic expectations. But some people didn't realize that they have unrealistic ex aspirations and this can actually cause them some stress. A mid-career letdown can happen to anyone from doctors to construction workers. Our work relationships also can influence the mid-career crisis. As we age, we are often forced to form new relationships with coworkers. Maybe we become managers or we work from home or our bosses are younger than us. If we advance in our career, we tend to mentor, but if not, then we tend to resent those younger workers, especially if they become our bosses. Another problem that can influence or create the mid-career crisis is outdatedness. We can become stuck in our ways of work, and then younger people come in fresh out of college and know all the new techniques, all the new technologies, um, and this can create a fear of being considered incompetent or even worthless. And then there is also uh, the inability to change jobs that we often see in middle adulthood. So age discrimination usually begins around 35 and is actually most pronounced around 45. So if you're thinking about switching jobs in middle adulthood, it can be difficult to get hired due to this age discrimination. The federal law does prevent age discrimination, but it's not really enforced. And employers can usually just tell older applicants that they are overqualified and get away with discrimination. Another thing that leads to a mid-career crisis is the uh, crisis of generativity, which is the need to produce, to generate something, some type of legacy to leave behind after you're gone. Um, and this can come in the form of giving advice to younger people, or this can come in the form of um, leaving a legacy behind at work, accomplishing a lot at your job. Okay, that concludes this chapter. Head on over to Moodle and complete the journal assignment and the forum assignment, and then we will see you for the next chapter. Have a good day.